Welcome to the Allen Public Library. We have an outstanding program tonight. Mark Shaw is the author of dozens of books, four of which involve John F. Kennedy. Mr. Shaw has been an legal analyst for CNN News, ESPN, ABC News, and USA Today. Thank you for joining us, Mark Shaw. Thank you, Tom, and thanks for having me back at your incredible library here. It's a very much of a pleasure. So uh, tonight we're going to go on a journey, all of us, and let's get started right now. Father, I love her. I love her very much. I've never had a feeling oh, like shut this. shut up. Young lady, you don't fool me one bit. I'm not trying to, but I bet I could, though. No, you might convince this jackass that you love him, but you'll never convince me. That's too bad, because I do love him. Certainly. For his money? No, honestly. Have you got the nerve to stand there and expect me to believe that you don't want to marry my son for his money? It's true. Then what do you want to marry him for? I want to marry him for your money. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Dorothy, if you had to be confined to one job of the many that you do, which would it be? Well, Ed, I love television. I have so much fun on What's My Line, playing the game, and I love our morning radio program, too. But I think that I would have to settle for my first love and my true love, the newspaper business. It uh, still has me and always will, I think, I hope. Of course, that was Marilyn Monroe playing Lorelei Lil in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And of course, most people remember that film for her singing Diamonds Are a, best, uh, a Girl's Best Friend. And then second, uh, JFK at the inauguration. Who can forget those incredible words? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And then Dorothy Kilgallen, a remarkable woman, a journalist uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, she's talking there about, uh, you know, the different careers she had. Many people just remember her for her starring role on What's My Line? Uh, the quiz show on CBS for 15 years. Ten million people watch that every Sunday night with Dorothy uh, on the panel. She then talked about, uh, you know, her, uh, her radio show she had with her husband, Breakfast with Dorothy and Dick in New York City in the 19, early 1960s. One million people listened to that program. And third, that's an interview with, uh, many of you might remember, Edward R. Murrow's person-to-person -person television show on CBS. Uh, anybody who was anybody wanted to be on that show, and Dorothy was there. And so that was the interview that she was giving uh, with regard to the three different careers that she had and how much being a newspaper woman uh, meant to her. This particular book is the culmination of 15 years of experience on my part, of research on my part. But first, I want to say, I want to show you this. These were three living, breathing human beings. Uh, JFK was, uh, you know, uh, on to become, you know, he was president and he had many years ahead of him. Uh, Dorothy did as well as a columnist and all that in Maryland with her acting career. But then we had these three headlines. And each one of these headlines is absolutely false. There is no truth to any one of them. Maryland did not commit suicide. JFK was not killed by one person, Lee Harvey Oswald. That's as ridiculous today as it was back then. And Dorothy Kilgallen did not die of an overdose of drugs in 1965. These three individuals died within 40 months of each other. Maryland in 62, August, JFK in November of 63, and Dorothy in November of 65. So this is what we lost in those particular three years. And what I have involved in this particular book are three true crime murder mysteries involving these three individuals, which were not true crime murder mysteries at all. The relevance of this book is the fact that nobody asked questions at the time. And that is a good lesson for us to learn. I don't know who said it, but if you don't listen, you know, and, and, and remind yourself of what history is all about, you'll make the same mistakes as, as well. So these days, we need to question things, especially when the government is involved, government agencies, because that's exactly what happened with these three individuals. 
So as a historian, I tried to see what I might be able to do to connect these three individuals, and I'll tell you that I was never even going to do so. But I ended up doing so, and it was quite an adventure. And in fact, I did it kind of what I would call ass backwards, which is, uh, I, I would tell you uh, somewhat uh, what I've done with most of my life. Uh, former criminal defense lawyer, and then I got into uh, legal analysts with the uh, television networks and did television shows, and then became an author in 1962 when I wrote a book about Mike Tyson. Because logically, you can say to yourself, what would you do? You would investigate Marilyn Monroe's death first, right? 19 1962, JFK 63 and Dorothy Kilgallen, 65. Well, I didn't do that. Because what I did, and these are the, the books that preceded the one I'm going to talk about tonight. I first of all looked at the JFK assassination, 1963. The two books were Melvin Belli, King of the Courtroom. Melvin Belli, if you don't remember, was Jack Ruby's attorney. Well, I had a, had a real advantage with regarding to write a biography of him because I knew the man. I practiced law in his building in the 1980s. And Belli was a bigger-than-life figure, flamboyant, not always uh, obeying by the rules of, of being a lawyer, but he got all these amazing uh, verdicts from big uh, pharmaceutical companies and all of that. But when I was writing that book, I will tell you, and you'll see how all this kind of connects as it goes along and where I, where I could connect this and that, the dots, and sometimes I ran into obstacles and everything. But with Belli, I learned that he loved the mafia and the mafia loved him. He would go to Las Vegas and pretend to, to be a mafioso by sitting at the table with other mafia people. His main client was Mickey Cohen, who was a Los Angeles gangster, and the, I remember the FBI headline, uh, this man is considered dangerous, he's a cold-blooded killer. That was his main client. Yes, he represented Muhammad Ali and the Rolling Stones and others, but Bill, I love the mafia. So when I was writing that book, I kept asking myself, you know, I wonder about this. How in the world did he become Jack Ruby's lawyer? He was a personal injury lawyer. He hadn't tried a damn criminal case in 25 years, and yet he ends up with Ruby as his client. And then I looked further, and what did he do at trial? He wouldn't let Ruby testify. He made him look crazy through an insanity defense that made no sense at all. And what did the jury do? Well, of course, they convicted Jack Ruby. So I had all these questions in my mind. If there's anything that I feel like I possess, it's a real curiosity. You know, I read three books a couple summers ago, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Einstein, uh, thinking that if I read those, maybe I'd become a bit smarter somehow or another. Well, that didn't work. But I noticed in each of those three books, what did it say? Those three men uh, gave credit to the fact that each of them was curious. So that got my curiosity up for Melvin Belli, that book. And then I decided, okay, you know, I'm a little bit curious about that 1960 election. What happened then? Now, if you remember, it was JFK versus Richard Nixon. And Joe Kennedy, who's, who, uh, the, the Boys and Patriarch, whose uh, picture's up there at the top. Well, you may remember, Joe Kennedy was, uh, you know, a very powerful, uh, wealthy man. Uh, FDR appointed him attorney, uh, excuse me, ambassador to Great Britain. He went over there and he made a couple mistakes because Joe wanted to be president of the United States, but he made a couple mistakes. He kind of had a friendship with Adolf Hitler, which wasn't very popular, and he bashed FDR all the time. And finally, they yanked him back to the United States of America, and, and it looked like everything was done. And Joe said to himself, well, "You know what? If I can't be president, then one of my sons will be president." what well, was supposed to be Joe Kennedy Jr., but he got killed in the war. So who's up next? JFK. And people don't really believe me sometimes when I tell you this, but it's, it's documented in this book and the others. Joe Kennedy really thought that there would be 24 years of Kennedys. JFK, Bobby, and then who? Ted. And so the 60 elect election comes up, and what happens? Joe Kennedy finds out they're going to lose the election because they can't win West Virginia and Illinois. And so what does he do? He calls in some of his friends from his bootlegging days, Sam Giancana, Carlos Marcello, some of the mafia guys, and says to them, listen, I'll make you a deal. You can't turn this deal down. You help me win those states and put JFK in the White House, and what will I do for you? We'll leave you guys alone when we get in the White House. Well, they went ahead and they won that election for Jack Kennedy, put him in the White House, and then I had a had an eyewitness there, a very, very celebrated journalist named John Sigenthaler, who was one of the founders of USA Today, that I interviewed. He was right there when Joe Kennedy ordered JFK to appoint Bobby Kennedy Attorney General. 
And predictably, Bobby Kennedy, who we'll, we'll get into much more in this presentation, uh, went ahead and did what? He went after those mafioso, just as he had done at the Mc, 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 um, McClellan racketeering hearings. And so I put all that in the Poison Patriarch, and I tried to show that, you know, that the 60 election was fixed, and Bobby Kennedy did this and he did that, and one of those individuals that he deported, and we'll talk about him, was Carlos Marcello, a New Orleans uh, mafia don. And so that book was published and did very well, and so I thought, well, you know, I I'm done. But just like you would be, I think, when I was, inter when I was researching the Melvin Belli book, uh, I interviewed a friend of Belli's, a, a doctor down in, uh, in San Diego. And I said, you know, let's talk about Belli, and we did, and he gave me these stories and everything, married six times, and at one time he, he decided he was gonna throw the dogs off the Golden Gate Bridge during the divorce proceedings. I mean, he was a real character. But he said, you know, it's curious, Mark, before we're done, you know, he knew Dorothy Kilgallen. And I said, well, wait a minute, the only thing I know about her is she was a star of What's My Line. Was she on the show? He said, Mark, you don't know anything about her, okay? She was a syndicated column, columnist with her uh, Voice of Broadway show, and we'll get into that in a minute with a couple of photographs for you. And by the way, this book is not my opinions. It's not my conjecture. It's not my speculation. Through documents, um, through photographs, through personal accounts, that's all I use in my books. And the books that I use for the new one, nothing that I, that I use that was passed about 1967 or 68. So it was all current material. And I pride myself on doing that. So anyway, with regard to that whole situation there, I, I began to, to, to try to think about Dorothy Kilgallen. He said, well, she had the syndicated column to 200 newspapers. The radio show was listened to by a, a hundred uh, a million people a day. Uh, she um, had, had uh, you know, all the different things that she did, but also, uh, what's my line? But also, Mark, she covered uh, three of the biggest trials of the 20th century. And I said, well, what were those? Well, it was Dr. Sam Shepard, which you may remember became the Fugitive Series. series. Uh, what was the next one? Lindbergh baby kidnapping case. And Mark, she said, she covered the Jack Ruby trial. She covered the JFK assassination. Well, that I can remember the aha moment I had. J Dorothy Kilgallen did all that? And so I began to look into this woman's life and times, and that became the best-selling, the reporter who knew too much. And we're gonna talk about Dorothy in just a little bit, so I won't get too much more into that. But Dorothy Kilgallen, I am not really your guide tonight. Dorothy Kilgallen is. Because she was, uh, you know, an incredible reporter, a, a woman of integrity. How many people you know, who've watched my video presentations on YouTube, almost, you know, two million people have watched them uh, and seen the presentations of internet, come back to me by email from around the world and say, boy, I wish we had a reporter like Dorothy Kilgallen today with the integrity that she had. And so Dorothy Kilgallen is our guide in many ways. So I wrote the, the reporter who knew too much and just continued on to think about exactly where I was gonna go with all this. Well, so what was next? There's Melvin Belli, okay? Uh, in his office in San Francisco. That's him with Mickey Cohen. There's JFK and, and, uh, and uh, Joe Kennedy. There's Frank Sinatra, and I should have mentioned, who was the conduit between Joe Kennedy and those mobsters I talked about? Frank Sinatra. You know, I can't listen to a Frank Sinatra song without wanting to throw up. And I'll tell you why. Was he a great singer? Sure he was. But he was a bad guy. He beat up people, he beat up journalists. He was a womanizer as bad as JFK and Bobby were. He, he, he was just a terrible human being in many ways, and you'll see how he figures into, uh, into Marilyn Monroe's death. There's Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy at the McClellan Committee. His dad once said about Bobby Kennedy, you know, he hates just like I do. And you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, Joe Kennedy was a bad guy as well fixing the elections. You know that he actually, you talk about womanizers. Each of the Kennedys decided they wanted a trophy wife and then they wanted a trophy mistress. And while he was married to Rose, and I use this book that nobody else had ever even quoted from, Rose. It's a biography by Charles Higgum that was written. And boy, what did I learn in there? She knew about the fix in West Virginia and Illinois. But you know at one particular point, Joe Kennedy was audacious enough to sail to Europe, and one, on, on one end of the ship was Rose, and on the other end of the ship was Gloria Swanson, his mistress. That's the kind of guy Joe Kennedy was, and it filtered down to his sons. 
And you're going to find out who that powerful man is, man who is responsible for all three of the deaths that I've talked about there. Then we have, that's, uh, is that, yeah, that's Carlos Marcello. April 1961 changed everything about history. And how did that happen? Because Bobby Kennedy deported Marcello, who he hated, to Guatemala, to the jungles of Guatemala. When Marcello came back in the country, he went ahead and, uh, um, you know, started doing his bootlegging in New Orleans, a $6 billion empire with everything. And Bobby Kennedy went after him again, tried to deport him. And as the end of 1963 comes along, end of 1963, November, Marcello's had enough. And he says to himself, I'm going to get rid of that little, and I don't want to say it on the air, that little you-know-what. And yet, he couldn't get rid of that little you-know-what, because if he killed Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy would have come after him with everything the government had, right? So what does he do? He orchestrates the assassination of JFK, so Bobby Kennedy will be powerless. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. Bobby Kennedy never went after those guys. He finally resigned as attorney general and then ran for president and got himself assassinated in 1978. All right, so there's the JFK assassination, all right, in 63. There's uh, uh, Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald. There's Melvin Belli with his client, Jack Ruby. One thing I learned during this, uh, this process, and, and frankly, it's not in the book because I didn't think of it at the time. If you really want to cover up uh, a death, what's the easiest way to do it? Well, as you will see, the first one that I, that I found was this autopsy situation with JFK. You know, uh, Dr. Cyril Weck, who's uh, the, the, the main forensic scientist, I think, in the country, all the famous cases, Michael Jackson, all these different kinds of cases, uh, O.J. Simpson, all of them. And he's become a personal friend of mine, such a wise man. And you'll hear what he had to say about Marilyn Monroe's uh, autopsy in a little while. But with regard to this, I mean, in his book, uh, where is it? Uh, I guess I didn't bring it. In his book, uh, talking about different autopsies, celebrity autopsy, he calls this the worst autopsy that was ever done. That little snippet up there shows that Instead of doing the autopsy for JFK at Parkland Hospital, you may remember the Secret Service just whisked his body off to a Washington. And they used these junior medical examiners to look at the President of the United States' autopsy. And as Sarah Wick told me, uh, there, there was no truth to, to much of that autopsy as, at, at all. So that's the autopsy. Then, as far as what happened to um, to uh, Jack Kennedy at Daly Plaza. And you'll see a couple pictures in a minute of Dorothy being there when she covered the JFK assassination. But you know, I don't know what happened at Daly Plaza. Nobody does. Uh, I've had a, a wonderful woman named Kathleen in Dallas come forward who gives a very logical way of, could, uh, how, of how it could have happened. Uh, storm drains and so on and so forth. Was it at the Tex Texas uh, Depository Building, the, the school de depository? Was it up at the Grassy Knoll? Where was it? Well, again, I'm always looking for the best primary source I can, and that is a biography, autobiography by Jesse Curry, who was the Dallas police chief. And you know what he says in there? The first thing he did when he heard the shots, guess where he sent the police? To the overpass. Not to the depository building, none of that. So for me, that's the most credible account of what may have happened. May change my mind with new research. I get tips all the time from people, and I'm always open to what they say. And there's one of the, you know, the worst human beings that ever lived on the face of the earth, J. Edgar Hoover. Why? Well, because this is what he, let me see if I can find it. This is what he uh, said uh, when JFK uh, was killed. It is important that all the facts surrounding President Kennedy's assassination, this was, a, this was a letter sent to the Justice Department, important that all the facts surrounding President Kennedy's assassination be made public in a way that will satisfy people in the United States and abroad that all of the facts have been told and that a statement to this effect be made now. The public must be satisfied that Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin that he did not have Confederates who are still at large, and the evidence of such is such that he would have been convicted at trial. Speculation about Oswald's motive ought to be cut out. That's the FBI director. 
Now, people have said to me, why was he yelling out this Oswald alone theory all the time? Well, it's easy to figure out. If it's a lone nut, as they called Oswald, right, the FBI can't be held accountable, right? But if there's a plot to kill the president, and I don't use that C word, C-O-N-S-P-I, that word, I don't like that word, it, it just deflates from what really happened. There was a plot to kill the president. And if that happens, then JFK, or excuse me, uh, Lee, uh, J. Edgar Hoover would have been held responsible. So who assassinated JFK? Well, just as I did when I was a criminal defense lawyer and when I covered those famous trials and everything, I look at the detective, detective's best four friends. Motive, means, opportunity, benefit from the crime. But most of all, motive. All right. Now, this was interesting because uh, I interviewed Jack Ruby's prosecutor, Bill Alexander, for the Poison Patriarch. And he said, Mark, you know, I, I was shocked that JFK got killed. Bobby Kennedy had many more enemies than, than Jack Kennedy did. And you know, he's right. I kind of listed them here because, yes, you've got the people who uh, have the motive to kill uh, JFK, the CIA, of course. Hoover hated the Kennedys. He always hated the Kennedys. Cuban dissidents, the military complex. Uh, JFK was going to bring us out of, uh, of Vietnam, at least it looked like he might, and that's going to really cause problems for the military complex. But look on the other side. You still got J. Edgar Hoover, Lyndon Johnson, obviously. If you talk about motive, yes, the person that I'm going to tell you had the greatest motive to have killed JFK is Carlos Marcello, but he's really in second place when you think about it because of who benefited most from JFK's death. Lyndon Johnson, all right? But I've never been able to connect him, there's so many layers involved in everything, to the killing of JFK. You've got Frank Costello, he was the New York Don that we'll talk about a little, Giancana, Santo Traficante, a, a, a mafioso, dangerous mafioso in, uh, in uh, Tampa, Florida. Mickey Cohen, Meyer Lansky, the financier of all the mobsters, and then there's the big name, Carlos Marcello. Motive to get Bobby Kennedy off of his back. And that's exactly what happened. So let's turn to dear Dorothy, who I've come to love and respect over the years. That's Dorothy. Now, let me just tell you, and there, I'm going to get at the end all the similarities between Dorothy and Marilyn. But Dorothy and Marilyn were amazing in terms of overcoming all the obstacles to get to the top of their professions. That's Dorothy Kilgallen. First of all, she was a college dropout, all right? She convinced her father, who was a very fine uh, journalist at the New York Journal of America, to get her a, an internship. And then she worked from that internship and on up to becoming, at one point, I will tell you, the New York Post said she was the most powerful female voice in America. I would say she was kind of a combination of, of uh, Diane Sawyer and Oprah and whoever else, you know? Nobody ever liked her at the time. And that's her at a young age. They had what they called the race around the world. And what that involved was uh, three people, two men and her, uh, two other newspapermen and her, and they went around the world using commercial, uh, to com commercial transportation, ships, planes, so on and so forth. And that's Dorothy going around the world there. Well, she finished runner-up to one of the men, but she had the courage to do that all by herself. The only thing she took with her was a hat box with a few clothes in it and her typewriter. That's Dorothy at that typewriter. And boy, could she write. If I could write as well as Dorothy Kilgallen could, and in collateral damage, you will see all these examples, I may be able to, to read one for you, of her incredible uh, work as a, wor uh, as a wordsmith. Beautiful language, vocabulary, all of that. How's this for en an endorsement? From the guy over there, there's her vo Voice of Broadway column. How about that guy she's sitting there uh, with? Who's that? Ernest Hemingway said to her, she's the greatest female writer in the world. She probably wouldn't have liked that female in there, but that's quite a compliment, is it? And that's who she was. She was, in, she was incredible with that. And then, of course, that's Dorothy on What's My Line with Bennett Cerf, um, Arlene Francis, and, uh, and John Daly. This is my favorite photo of Dorothy. At the Jack Ruby, excuse me, at the Dr. Sam Shepard case, okay? She's standing in the middle of the courtroom and look at her. All the other reporters are surrounding Dorothy in admiration. She had the best sources. That's why we'll, we'll talk about that with the JFK assassination. But they adored her. 
And, and, and yes, there were the, the competitions and there were some snide remarks made about Dorothy. One of the things about her that was brought up last night, she wasn't the most beautiful woman in the world, but my wife, in fact, told me today, you know, it was, it was the clothes she wore and the way she acted and, and just the way that she, uh, you know, the power that she had in all of that. An amazing woman, uh, for sure. And you know you've made it when you're on a Flintstones episode, correct? All the things she did, she might have been uh, happier with regard to this. They, they, they did it in a, an episode involving um, where Barney, Barney gets in trouble for gambling or whatever it was, and Fred gets in trouble and all this, and she's Dorothy Kilgranite on the, on the Flintstones, okay? And it was a big hit and everything. You can go to, excuse me, you can go to uh, YouTube and watch it. It's, it's an amazing, it's called The Little White Lie is the name of the, of the program. So now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some books a little later that I'm going to say should be called Distortions of History because each one of them is. Many of those books don't even mention Dorothy. They're written about the JFK assassination, for God's sakes, and they don't even mention Dorothy, all right? And, and many of them say, well, she wasn't at the Ruby trial. She didn't interview Jack Ruby. This is her in Daly Plaza. That's Dorothy being whisk, uh, frisk, excuse me, frisk, going into the courtroom, and that's Dorothy at a news conference with Melvin Belli. These people just don't do their homework. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. It took me six years to get through Purdue University. I was a terrible law student. I'm still not the smartest guy, but all this was out there. And as I say, the relevance, as somebody, uh, this, this one woman last night, uh, Kathleen, told me, the relevance is we don't ask questions. They didn't ask them then, and unfortunately, we don't ask them today, as we should. All right, so what did Dorothy write about the JFK assassination? Well, let's think about this. Here's J. Edgar Hoover going this direction and hoodwinking and deceiving and everything with regard to the JFK assassination and everybody bought it except one reporter, Dorothy Kilgallen. The first column she wrote, the Oswald, Oswald file must not close six days after JFK died. And I should tell you it was personal with Dorothy she had taken her, they were friends. He'd been to her home when he was a senator in New, in New York. Um, she took her son, Kerry, her youngest son, to the White House. JFK made a big uh, fuss over him, gave him a PT-109 pin, S said, you know, uh, looked at the letters he brought from his third grade class. She wrote uh, in her column, uh, the man who, uh, 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 what I remember is a tall man stooping over a little boy in the, in the White House, uh, looking at the letters he brought from the third grade class. This is the man who was assassinated in Dallas. It was personal. And you did not want to get on the wrong side of Dorothy Kilgallen when it was personal. So she wrote that column. Then the second one, Ruby Stars at Last. It has to do with the fact that she was going ahead and, uh, inter and, and, and was the only reporter out of 400 at the, at the trial who interviewed Jack Ruby. And I have it on the DorothyKilgallenStory.org. All of her photographs, her columns, videotaped interviews and everything. I have Joe Tonahill, the co-counsel for Ruby, uh, telling people exactly how she ended up with those, those interviews. Because why? Guess what program Jack Ruby used to watch every single week he could at the carousel? What's my line? So he was a big fan of Dorothy. That's how she got the interviews. And so she wrote this, uh, this article about him. I don't have time to read it. It's in the book, but the wordsmith is just incredible. Um, the hustler in the black suit uh, and a very white shirt, neat and nervous, the star of the show at last. If he died tomorrow and he won't, he would be die happy in the knowledge that he had made the big time. The third one, this is really important because we'll tie it in a little bit with the Ruby trial transcripts. It says, Ka, uh, Claims Dallas cops lived at Ruby's place. Claims Dallas cops lived at Ruby's place. Well, what was interesting about this was that uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, and it says through her contacts in New York, through her Voice of Broadway column, these different acts came to her and said, well, well you know what, when we came to Dallas, we performed at Jack Ruby's Trip Club, and guess who was in all the seats next to us? The police, okay? 
Well, later on, the Warren Commission, which Dorothy will bash, as I will tell you, said that there, there was no friendship there. That never happened. Well, of course it happened. It's another distortion of history. And then, of course, she wrote this column. Oops. All right. Nervous Ruby feels breaking point near. And this is when, uh, this is when uh, after she'd, she'd interviewed Ruby, and she talked about what it was like. And the only line I'll uh, read to you, because I don't have a time to do so, was that in the column she wrote, I went out, after the interview, I went out in the almost empty lunchroom corridor one, wondering what I really believed about this man. So Dorothy Kilgallen goes on, and she, she's there at the Ruby trial. I always wondered in my own mind, you know, what'd she learn there? Well, I found these. And you know how I found them? This is the Ruby trial transcripts, the most accurate documents about the JFK assassination in history. And they're hidden, for, hidden from view right down the way here in Dallas at Daly Plaza by the sixth floor museum at Daly Plaza, which I'll get into in a little bit. And the distortions of history every single day there. They won't let people see this because down there it's a shrine to Lee Harvey Oswald. And they're that important. 6,000 pages, excuse me, 2,000 pages. And you know I found them? A lawyer in Fresno, California called me and he said, you know, Mark, I brought the reporter who knew too much and I went ahead and, and, in, the, in the afternoon and I read it and I, at midnight, I, I just read the book and I thought to myself, I have a gift for you. And Greg Mullinex was his name. And he, and he called me and he said, I have this gift, and he sent me those documents, and there they are. And I read every page of 2,000 pages. And what do you think I found in there? The reason why the, 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 the Sixth Floor Museum doesn't want to use them, the reason why they're not in any of these books that I'm going to criticize in a little while, is because they completely destroy the Oswald alone theory. At one particular point, uh, and I think I have it over there, Basically, uh, Ruby is uh, overheard in a phone conversation by a gentleman who has a parking lot across from the uh, Carousel Club. And this is what the jury heard, and this is what Dorothy heard from a front row seat when they were talking about the transfer of Lee Harvey Oswald. You know what he says? See the last line down there? I will be there, or he will be there. It also talks about, and it connects with Dorothy's column, that he got into the police department basement, what? through his friends in the police department, and the third one in there that just stuck with me and made me just upset that these distortions of history continue was, he said, I'll make like a reporter, and I found evidence before that that's what he did when Oswald was being questioned by the Dallas police. Distortions of history abounding. So, what did Dorothy do after she interviewed Jack Ruby? Well, uh, she, she didn't go to Washington, D.C. looking in the military complex. She didn't go to Miami, the Cuban exiles. She didn't uh, stay in Dallas for Lyndon Johnson. She went on and went to New Orleans. And that's where this man was, Carlos Marcello, all right? And what uh, Mark Sinclair, whose uh, who's, uh, video is on the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org, what he's pointing to there is a story uh, that, that Dorothy did uh, about uh, uh, the Warren Commission and Jack Ruby's um, testimony there because Dorothy exposed that testimony before it was supposed to be released by the President of the United States. That didn't make her any friends for sure. But what he's, he's saying there is that they went to New Orleans and, they, and, and Dorothy uh, sent him back to New York and said, don't tell anybody you were here. And then she went to New York and made the biggest mistake of her life. She started saying, I'm going to uh, crack the JFK assassination uh, you know, uh, uh, wide open. I'm going to show who did this. I'm going to show who covered it up. I'm writing a book for Random House about it, all of that. And at that point, Sinclair says, she, she said to him, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm afraid for my life and my family. I'm going to get a gun. And she said to Charles Simpson, the other uh, hairdresser, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life and she was dead just a few months later. Dorothy Kilgallen was found in her uh, uh, townhouse on East 68th Street in New York, uh, in a bedroom she never slept in, in a bed she never slept in, wearing clo bed clothes like she was going to a party. She had her false eyelashes, her hairpiece, and her makeup on. There was a book on her lap, upside down, 
that she supposedly was reading. Her reading glasses were nowhere. And yet the police, when they came, after her body was found at 9 in the morning and they came at 3 in the afternoon, found an empty bottle of Secanol pills by her side. There's where she, uh, she went ahead and uh, uh, exposed uh, Ruby's testimony. And then about the Warren Commission, basically she says it was laughable. Uh, oh, also, uh, with regard to that, uh, two government agency, uh, agents were sent by Hoover to uh, make her tell her uh, given them her, her sources as to where she got the uh, Jack Ruby testimony. And you know what she said? Uh, I'm not going to tell you, and I would rather die than give you my sources. This was, uh, okay, now we'll talk about that in a second. So Dorothy was found in her, in her townhouse. They found the empty uh, second oil bottle, and the verdict was uh, acute barbiturate overdose along with alcohol, and then they added circumstances undetermined. Well, you saw the headline earlier. That's not what got into the press. The press took it to believe because the medical examiner's office, a junior medical examiner, went ahead and told them that it was an overdose of drugs. So just like the headline with JFK that wasn't true and the one we'll talk about with Marilyn, it wasn't true about Dorothy either, as, 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 as I will show to you, uh, based on the fact that she was murdered because she was the reporter who knew too much. So. No investigation of any kind. They interviewed no one. Case done, case closed, over. And Dorothy Kilgallen then, nobody stood up for her, uh, said Dorothy didn't have a drug problem, she didn't have an alcoholic problem, I proved that she didn't. And so that was the reputation, her reputation was ruined then. And I will tell you that from that point on, Dorothy Kilgallen disappeared from the face of the earth until I was able to bring her back, I suppose you would say, alive. And, and let people know about her uh, through the reporter who knew too much. This is how that she spent the last night of her life, at P.J. Clark's a bar in uh, Manhattan. That was the table where she was, number 37. I sat at, sat at table number 36 when I went there to investigate. She was at the Regency Hotel uh, bar, and that's her townhouse afterwards. So we get to the point where you're probably asking yourself, and we'll just run through this, who killed Dorothy Kilgallen? Well, there's certainly, a, there's certainly several suspects, aren't there? We've got, uh, let's see, let's go on from there. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, this is the death certificate, which has all kinds of mistakes in it. Uh, her name is spelled with two L's, Kill Gallon, which is wrong. Uh, they have her birth date wrong. There's the verdict. There's uh, the autopsy. Okay, let's just quickly go with that. One barbiturate in her stomach, Tulanol. By my finding the autopsy at the National Archives, I proved there were three barbiturates in her stomach. And later on, they went ahead and did tests. Uh, a, a toxicologist did some tests and found those three barbiturates. And the real kicker to her being murdered was the fact that on a glass that was next to her bed, there were powder remnants of the barbiturates, which meant the capsules had been emptied. And nobody who could commit suicide would normally empty the capsules. They would simply go ahead and take those capsules. So that was a big deal. I interviewed Dr. Michael Bodden, whose name you might remember. He told me that they, they should not have said uh, to the press uh, overdose of drugs. They had no idea what happened. Who killed Dorothy Kilgallen? Frank Sinatra. They had a big feud. He didn't like her. She didn't like him. And so what happened then was that uh, he wrote, uh, she wrote some columns about him and his girlfriends being bimbos and his mafia, uh, uh, you know, uh, connections and all this. And, and he didn't like that, so he started making fun of her at, at, uh, uh, during his uh, Broadway show or his uh, Las Vegas show. Dorothy has, is the chinless wonder. She doesn't have a chin. If you run into her, run into her with a bus. I mean, it got pretty strong. In, the, in collateral damage for the first time, I show what happened, and that is Frank, Frank Sinatra tried to have sexual advances with, uh, with Dorothy Kilgallen, and she said no. You've got Marcello, of course. If Dorothy had put out the news that she was going to go ahead and write this book for Random House, Marcello couldn't let it happen. And J. Edgar Hoover, if she put in there that he, was gonna co that he had covered up the JFK assassination, he couldn't let that happen either. So there's a number of questions about Dorothy's death, and I've kind of covered them a bit, so I'll leave them to you 
because you can read the book and you can take a look at the different things as to what happened and the motives and the means and the opportunity and uh, the benefit from the crime. But I want to tell you about this one man and then we'll move on to Marilyn Monroe. This is Ron Pataki. He lives in Columbus, Ohio. He's about 86 years old and if it's the last thing I do in my life, I will put him in prison because he was a Judas to Dorothy Kilgallen. She didn't share her um, JFK assassination evidence with hardly anyone, but she shared it with this guy, a young guy who came along a few months before uh, she, was, she was dead, and, and I proved she was murdered, and uh, she confided in him. And it's interesting because a couple, things a couple things I knew after I looked, I went to Ron Pataki's website, and I wanted to see what he had written about Dorothy. And one of the things that we believe happened here is that she met what we call a mystery man at the Regency Hotel the night that she died after being on What's My Line. I have an eyewitness, Catherine Stone, who was interviewed, who saw her with this mystery man. Well, who was the mystery man? And so I'm able then to, to, to connect the dots, and it comes right back to Ron Pataki being there. And we believe that one of two things happened. Either he poisoned her drink with the barbiturates at the Regency Hotel, all right, and used quinine uh, to, to quench the, uh, the, the taste, or he accompanied her back to her townhouse and poisoned her there. Well, you can imagine how amazed I was when I found this poem on his website. Vodka roulette seen as relief possibility. While I'm spilling my guts, she is driving me nuts. Please. Fetched two, drink, two drinks on the run. Just skip all the poison. Uh, skip all the noise. Make one of them poison. And don't even tell me which one. I will tell you, I first had Cyrus Vance Jr., the uh, New York DA, say he would investigate Dorothy's death. And he did for eight months, and then he gave up. He said it was too expensive, and they didn't know what kind of harm came to Dorothy. And in the phone call that they made to me when I said, started arguing with me, he said, and besides, Mark, we don't know who did it, which was just completely adverse to saying we don't know any harm. I shook hands, and I'll show you the, the uh, uh, later on. Uh, uh, I went to New York in 2019 and met the commissioner, Dermot Shea, of the New York Police Department. He stood there and shook my hand and told me they were going to investigate death, Dorothy's death, and then lied to me. Right now, I've got a, a, a New York uh, Police Department uh, detective in the cold case squad who says he's going to investigate. I don't know if they will or not. They're all scored, scared to death of little Dorothy. But this is what happened. And then this is what I found out about um, about Ron Pataki. I found a witness in, in Las Vegas. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's really interesting how these, this information comes to me as a writer. I don't know where it comes from at times. I know Dorothy has kind of guided me from above with regard to things. I don't know if she's helped out with that. Some people will think I'm crazy saying that. But I think she has. And they come from everywhere. I wouldn't be surprised that after this presentation, I'll get 25 to 30 emails from people around the world who will have some interesting information about what happened uh, with, with not only Dorothy, but Marilyn as JFK as well. I got an email a day from a woman back east who says she knows exactly what happened to Marilyn Monroe when she died, and I'll follow up on that. So the interesting part here uh, is, and I'll just paraphrase what's up there, is that this gentleman in Las Vegas, who was a casino boss, told me that Ron Pataki had gotten himself in some trouble, probably gambling trouble, and some of these wrong people had come to him and said, you know, we can help you get out of that trouble. We need to know what Dorothy Kilgallen is going to put in her book for Random House. And I have no doubt in my mind that he told them, and basically then Dorothy Kilgallen was dead a few, uh, a few days later. So as I say, I'm going to do everything I can, and I'm going to continue on to see if I can't get uh, Dorothy Kilgallen uh, the justice she deserved. So where do we go from here? Well, here's the connection. You know what? My wife was shocked. I was going to quit. I was going to quit writing books, probably. I'd done what I could for the JFK assassination. I'd proved Dorothy Kilgallen was murdered and trying to get the justice for her. I was done. And then I get these emails of people that watch these presentations and everything, and they said one thing, one question. Is there a connection between the life and times, and especially the death, of Marilyn Monroe 
and Dorothy Kilgallen. And I had to say to myself, absolutely not. I don't, I don't know, think that there would be. Yeah, they were around at the same time and all of that. And then the first photograph I ran into was this Dorothy Kilgallen photograph with Marilyn Monroe in 1961 on the set of a film. I think it's called Let's Make Love. And there they would. There they were. And Dorothy was interviewing Marilyn Monroe. And you know, Marilyn uh, gets, a, gets a, bad, uh, a bad deal. She was never the dumb blonde that everybody thought she was. She was a brunette to begin with. She only changed her hair color and changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. You know, she was an orphan. She had a terrible childhood and all of that. But this was a very smart woman, as I'll show you in a minute. That's her at a very early age. And if you just want to read then one book about her, uh, where is it? You want to read my story. This was written by Marilyn Monroe with a prize-winning screenwriter uh, just a few, a few months, I believe, or at least a year before she died. And it's her story. And I, I assume that maybe it's not her writing, although I'm going to show you that she was an exceptional writer. But you really get inside Marilyn Monroe and what she thought and what she felt like and why she w felt like she was used by people and they only cared about her as a sex pot or because she was beautiful. And God knows she was beautiful. Every film that she made, if you think about it, when she was on screen, there was nobody else on screen. It was just Marilyn Monroe. So that was it. And then Dorothy wrote a column about here that'll make you cry when you read it. And it's about Marilyn's love life. You know, she was originally, when she was a teenager, she was married to a, a guy named uh, James Dougherty. And she finally wrote a book about, he finally wrote a book about that. It was a teenage mari uh, marriage. Uh, Instead of going back to the orphanage, if she married, she, she wouldn't have to. They got married. They had a wonderful time together. She finally decided that she didn't want anything but to be a movie star, and all that's in my story uh, in terms of how she felt about that. And so that was a divorce. Next, she married Joe DiMaggio, the uh, New York Yankees Hall of Famer, okay? And that'll play a lot into the clue that I got leading me to who I believe caused the death of Marilyn. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, when that... Marriage was over, she married the playwright Arthur Miller. All those three marriage didn't work out, and so she wrote this about Marilyn, the golden girl loses third marriage pursuing love. And you know, it does bring a t it brought a tear to my eye. I mean, you're gonna hear me get upset about these. None of these three people should have died, least alone Marilyn Monroe. No way it should have happened. She fell in with the wrong people, as you will see. And what this talks about is Marilyn was like a little girl who went to the toy store and here were all the toys and she could pick out any one she wanted to. And, and yet she found out the toys could cause her problems. Well, the toys were men. And so it talks about that, you know, all the problems she had with the marriages and, and men trying to use her for sex when she was in Hollywood and all this kind of stuff. And the last line is the one that, you know, now Marilyn Monroe is back out in the world. Hopefully she won't run into another toy that will cause her her problems. And obviously, she found that toy, as I will tell you. All right, so I kind of wondered always about Marilyn Monroe committing suicide. I don't know if you ever did. I just wondered about it when it happened. But I didn't pay any attention in 1962 that much. I don't think anybody did. It kind of came and went. The Cuban Missile Crisis was right after that. The Bay, of, all these different things had happened. So it kind of got lost in the shuffle. Well, I thought, you know, let's see what kind of mindset Dor uh, Marilyn Monroe had before she died. And I ran straight into this uh, column by Dorothy Kilgallen on August 3rd, 1962, one day before Marilyn died. And what does she say? Let me get it out so I can read it here, because it's so important. It was the clue that led me to everything. Marilyn Monroe's health must be improving. She's attending select Hollywood parties, and he's become the talk of the town. In California, they're circling a photograph of her that certainly not as bare as the famous calendar, but it's very interesting. And she's cooking in the sex appeal department. Two, she's proved vastly alluring to a handsome gentleman who is a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio in his heyday. So don't write off Marilyn as being finished. Well, that made me think, does that sound like somebody to you that's going to commit suicide? It certainly didn't me, and that curiosity took over. So I started to look into Marilyn, who she was, and I found this book.
And I'm amazed at how many people now around the world have sent me uh, messages, emails, and everything, and said the one thing that they really have enjoyed about collateral damage, all the other things, is finding the book Fragments. And this is a book that shows Marilyn Monroe was no dumb blonde. She was an intellectual, and she was a terrific writer as well, and curious. Uh, you know, nobody ever looked at that side of her. They missed it all. They really missed it all. And this book contains her writings at hotels on the backs of uh, hotel stationery on the back of grocery receipts, all of that. It's filled with her writings and poems. And as you can, if you can see there, you know, just, just think about this. Life, I am, I am both of your directions, somehow remaining hanging downward the most, but strong as a cobweb in the wind. I exist more with the cold, glistening frost, but my beaded rays have the colors. I've seen in a painting, ah, life, they have cheated you. Many more, very introspective. That was the inside of Marilyn Monroe, squealing, screaming out, treat me as with respect. Treat me with respect. Please treat me with respect. You know what's the, what's the kicker with regard to Marilyn Monroe being a smart woman? She read Ulysses. You tried to read Ulysses? I did. I never got to the second page, okay? That's who she was. And she never got credit for that at all. And instead, this is what we got, this damn headline. And as you'll see, it was completely false, and nobody questioned it at the time. So what did I do then? Well, I thought maybe I was stuck with regard to things, but who comes through for me again? Dorothy Kilgallen. And without her, I would never, you know, she's the only person in history, and I didn't put this in the book because I didn't think of it. She's the only reporter in history who investigated the Marilyn Monroe's death and JFK's death that I know of. I don't think there was anybody like that. So what'd she do? She wrote this column called, Martha Proves She's a Trooper. Well, it's about Martha Ray, the, uh, the actress, and she fell down and hurt her leg or something. But what it is, it's a Bible of the questions that Dorothy Gil Kilgallen had about Marilyn Monroe's death. And she got some of them from mail and all of that. But basically, it was, it was to say, wait a minute, uh, Marilyn Monroe was found in the nude in, this, in, in her bedroom. She didn't sleep in the nude. Uh, her light was on in the bedroom. She slept in the dark. Uh, there was no glass around where she could have ingested. Supposedly, Marilyn died of this overdose of between 40 and 50 um, barbiturate pills uh, in, a, in a very short period of time on the evening of August 4th, 1962, and I'll prove that that was false. But she asked about that. She asked about other problems with regard to what happened. That, that she just didn't understand that the police hadn't looked into this and all. And basically, at the end of this column, she says, uh, I can't answer all of these questions, but I have a feeling the real story hasn't been told, not by a long shot. She didn't believe the Oswald alone theory. She didn't believe Marilyn Monroe uh, committed suicide. All right. So then we get to the autopsies. And as I've said, if you want to cover up a death, just screw up the autopsy and then let people know uh, untruths about all this. So here's Marilyn's autopsy, all right? Uh, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, this is the autopsy. August 5th, 1962, day after she died, what does it say? Acute barbiturate poisoning, ingestion of overdose, right? It's an overdose, right? No, it's not. A few more hours go by and now what is it? It's a probable suicide. How did that happen? We may never know, except for the fact that we know about the, the medical, junior medical examiner that was involved. You know, Dr. Cyril Weck, when he, when he and I were discussing what I might put in the book about this, he said, you know, Mark, I've done 16,000 autopsies in my, in my life. I've never seen a verdict in one of them, probable suicide. That's like guessing, you know? Maybe she committed suicide and maybe she didn't. But of course, what do we go back to? We go back to the headline the media had, Marilyn kills herself. Well, this to Dr. Thomas Noguchi, and you may remember that name. He's the, the, tox the uh, medical examiner who, who handled some of the Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson and all this other kind of thing. And you know, the easiest way, as I say, to screw up a, a, a murder investigation or any kind of investigation is to do the, a, a bogus autopsy. Well, wait till you hear this. Not only did he not know what he was doing, but basically he then went ahead in an interview uh, just a few months after the autopsy and he said, 
You know, I did make a few mistakes. The toxicology report had only been performed on the blood and the liver, not the internal organs. I should have examined those. Did you hear that? Can you imagine? This is one of the most, this may be the most famous woman in the world. Look at the JFK assassination, what they did. The same thing with Dorothy and now with Marilyn. That's one of the similarities. And he said, um, yeah, uh, in fact, by the time I realized I'd made a mistake, now just think about this, I went to try to find those organs, but they had been destroyed. They had been destroyed. No justice for Marilyn, no justice for JFK, no justice for Dorothy Kilgallen. So, what do I go, where do I go from there? Well, I'm continuing to probe in my own mind what happened to Marilyn Monroe. And then, excuse me, and then I find this letter. Uh, well, okay, murdered, who could have done it? Well, we, we can, you can find out most of that out in the book, but that, it's the handsome gentleman who's bigger than Joe DiMaggio. I wanted to know what was going on in her life, okay? What kind of men was she involved with? So I, in my mind, I'm thinking, who's a bigger name than the most famous baseball player at the time, probably other than Babe Ruth, and that's Joe DiMaggio. And then I landed on the Kennedys. I thought, you know, those are bigger names, aren't they? Well, what did I find out? Here's a picture, a photograph, the only one, of Marilyn Monroe. That's Bobby Kennedy on the left and JFK on the right. And most people know that, well, everybody knows really, that Marilyn Monroe, for most people do, I guess, uh, sang happy birthday to JFK on his 45th birthday, one year before he died at Madison Square Garden in front of 15,000 people in this sequin dress that you could almost see through. Dorothy Kilgallen wrote uh, that it was like she was making love to the audience because Dorothy was there, okay? So I thought, okay, JFK, she must have had a relationship with him. I'll look into that. Well, I did, and she did, but it was very short-lived because Joe Kennedy, the politician, the patriarch, the poison patriarch, told JFK, look, you're going to run for president in 64. I don't want to see your name in the paper with Marilyn Monroe. And then I found this letter from Gene Kennedy Smith. It's just signed Gene Smith, but it's Gene Kennedy Smith. And it's to who? Marilyn Monroe. Understand that you and Bobby are the new item, exclamation mark. Uh, we think that you should come with him when he comes back east. Love, Susan Smith. Okay? Gene Smith. Well, it got me to thinking, wait a minute. This, uh, yeah, there's some sort of relationship with here with Bobby Kennedy. Maybe he took over when JFK dumped her, right? All right? So I'm thinking, well, this letter is fascinating, but I need proof. And I'm always looking for confirmation for things that I can go ahead and be able to use that are really going to make a difference with regard to the research that I'm going to present to my audience. So what do I do? I go ahead and I find a CIA document. I first thought it was an FBI document. Like I said, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and so it took me a while to figure out it was a CIA document. But it's on uh, July 8th, 1960. No, excuse me, on um, July uh, 8th of 1962. And here's what it says, right in the front. This is all in, in open view. All of this is available for people. Why didn't they find it? Because they didn't want to. Here's what it says. Robert Kennedy has been having a romance and sexual affair over a period of time with Marilyn Monroe. Uh, the first uh, date was arranged by his sister and brother-in-law, Peter Lawford, and so on and so forth. Robert Kennedy was deeply involved emotionally with Marilyn Monroe, and get this, and repeatedly Pr promised to divorce his wife to marry Marilyn. A deep love affair, Bobby Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. And so then I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, if that's what happened, then how am I going to go ahead and show how if Marilyn did not commit suicide but she was murdered, how am I going to find out if perhaps Bobby Kennedy had something to do with this? And so I started looking at different evidence that I could find. There's that uh, document. And this is uh, an amazing find on my part. I had nothing to do, uh, nothing to, uh, that I could really find that could have been better. And so I went ahead and I found out that there was this big party at the Cal Neva Lodge, which was on the California and uh, Nevada border. 
And uh, this is the Calneva Lodge, and that's uh, Buddy Greco, who's there with Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe was there as well. And uh, she was there, Frank Sinatra was there. Frank Sinatra was there. Uh, Sam Giancana, one of the gangsters, was there. Um, this buddy, uh, this uh, Gianni, Gianni Russo, who has re recently written a book called The Hollywood Godfather, he was there and gave an account of what happened. And Marilyn got the feeling that she was going to be passed around, possibly by those people that were there. Peter Lawford was there. There's been some questions as to whether the Kennedys were there. But anyway, at some point, she's had enough. And she goes ahead and she starts screaming, I want to go home, I've had it, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I feel like I've been used by like a piece of meat and I have a witness who was right there and I've had it with the Kennedys. I'm going to the media when I get back in Los Angeles. I'm going to tell them about the relationships, the sexual affairs I had with JFK and RFK. And so, well, that sounded like, you know, what a threat that would be and what would Bobby Kennedy think about her doing that? And so I found the other half then of the, of the uh, CIA document. And basically what this says is this. It talks about Marilyn, JFK, and Dorothy each having an obsession with UFOs. It says that JFK talked to, uh, to Marilyn Monroe about his obsession with UFOs and that he was going to investigate uh, Area 51 in uh, New Mexico. It talks about the fact that uh, Marilyn Monroe had threatened to go to the media about the love affairs. And worse than that, in that one sentence there is what ended up uh, being the cause of death for Marilyn Monroe. She, she supposedly said, and it's in the CIA document, I am going to let the media know about the, uh, about the matters of national security that JFK and Bobby have told me about, including killing Fidel Castro. Well, those Kennedys couldn't let her go to the media about the love affairs. That would have been bad enough, but they couldn't let her go to the media with regard to what happened with these matters of national security. For God's sakes, that almost amounts to treason. So what happens then? Well, I'm thinking, okay, my number one suspect is who? Bobby Kennedy. Motive? For sure. He's got to shut her mouth. All right? But what am I going to do? Well, I found a book called The Strange Death of Marilyn Monroe by Frank Capel. And it's a little thin book, as you can see, but it outlined not only the relationship between Marilyn and Dorothy, or excuse me, the relationship between Marilyn and, and Bobby Kennedy, but also the fact uh, about all the things that went on during the summer of 1962. Bobby Kennedy uh, had been there in the summer of 62 working on a movie based on his book, The Enemy Within, which makes fun and, and does all that and shows his hatred toward the mafioso. So basically, he was there during that time. Frank Capel shows that on the 26th and 27th in a ledger, I think I, I think I have that for you. There, the ledger on the right. He was at the Beverly Hills Hotel. So now we know he's in Los Angeles. We know he's having the sexual relationship with Marilyn Monroe. All right? And then in this particular book, he talks about the ruthlessness of Bobby Kennedy and the kind of person he is and all of that. Here's Bobby Kennedy at the time. He had six or seven children. That's Ethel. You've got Peter Lawford with... Uh, Frank Sinatra and Bobby Kennedy there, bad guys, all of them. The enemy within, as I said. Okay, and then this is, this is the big clue. What did I do here? Well, I was in trouble because I wanted to show that Bobby could have been involved with Marilyn's death, but he wasn't in Los Angeles at the time. He had an alibi. He was in, in the San Francisco area, okay? But I, I just couldn't believe that he was, and so I started looking into things, and I found this ledger at 20th Century Fox. You can read it for yourself, basically. But what does it say? That 11 o'clock on August 4th, 1962, the same day that Marilyn died, Bobby Kennedy and Peter Lawford arrive in a helicopter there. All right, so he's in Los Angeles. And then there was a book called The Beverly Hills Murder File. And it's by a Beverly Hills police officer who swears that he stopped a limousine at midnight on the 4th. There's uh, Peter Lawford driving. And if you don't know who Peter Lawford was, he was this actor with minimal uh, success and everything. Had married one of the Kennedy sisters and all of that. Ended up being an alcoholic. But he's driving the car. The officer says, Bobby Kennedy's in the back seat. And guess who's in the front seat with Peter Lawford? Dorothy Kilgallen's psychiatrist. So he was in Los Angeles. So then I tried to put things together, and what I learned was that on that particular day, they'd had enough of Marilyn. They went to her home. 
they begged her not to go to the media. And uh, Marilyn just refused. She'd been dumped. You know, there's this, this one image that I want to give you. You remember Marilyn, or Dorothy wrote about Marilyn just wanting love in her life so much? Well, what happened? JFK, the most powerful man in the world, you know, has a, has a brief love affair with her. And I don't know if he told her he loved her or not, but probably did. And then he dumps her. And then Bobby Kennedy takes up with her. And he has a love affair with her, a sexual affair and all of that. And tells her what? He's going to divorce Ethel. And then her calls won't be returned by JFK. And her calls won't be returned to the Attorney General's office by Bobby. And you can see Marilyn. It also makes me want to cry for her as I think she was crying, sitting by the phone. They won't have anything to do with her anymore. You can imagine the mindset there. But they go to the, her house, and I think it's pretty well chronicled in collateral damage, and they plead, plead with her not to go to the media. She says no. And what I've done in collateral damage is give a plausible way that Marilyn Monroe was eliminated, silenced, her mouth closed. She was killed. And Bobby Kennedy's operatives were involved, and I did this based on three clues that I had. There was a fresh bruise on Marilyn's um, hip that I found in the autopsy. The uh, uh, Marilyn's uh, housekeeper was doing laundry, washing things, when, washing sheets from Marilyn's uh, bedroom, I, uh, I've been able to uh, decide, uh, at, when the police came. And the amount of chloral hydrate that was in her system. You know, Dr. Noguchi couldn't find anything there in terms of her ingesting these things because there was nothing in her stomach, so I show a practical way that she could have been killed. Marilyn Monroe silenced at the age of 36 years old. So I could go on and show you FBI documents, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to. I'm just going to summarize that because there are FBI documents showing that the FBI sent the book, this book, to Bobby Kennedy, that they told him about all the allegations that Capel had made about this love affair and everything. And the clincher there for me is what the Kennedys did. Basically, they decided, along with the FBI, that they would buy every single copy of this book when it was released so that nobody could read it. Because they knew, excuse me, they knew what was in it was true. These were bad people that Marilyn fell into, a nest of Kennedys, a nest of Kennedys uh, that, uh, that ended up causing the end of her life. Uh, there's a couple other articles I could share with you, but I think we'll go on to this, this particular. What I wanted to do at the end of this book, there's the housekeeper, these, here's the FBI documents. What I wanted to do at the end of this book is I wanted to humanize these three individuals who did not and should never have died. Here's Marilyn, four of her most famous films. The Asphalt Jungle, that was the, that was the turning point in her career. Uh, a famous director, I can't think of his name right now, gave her a chance. And if you, if you watch that film, she's wonderful in it, in a serious role. Seven Year Itch, yes, the famous one in New York, remember where her, her, uh, her dress goes up. If you want to really see an amazing a film, there's no business like show business, and I want, I'm going to leave you today with a story about Marilyn that will warm your heart. And, of course, Misfits, the last film she did with Clark Gable. Very serious role. This one wasn't just a comedic sex pot. She was a real actor, and all she ever wanted to be known was a serious actress. So what did we lose here with Marilyn? We lost one of the greatest entertainers that we ever knew. And what did Marilyn lose? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay, that's the, the clues and everything are in the book. Uh, I want to get into a, some of the cover-ups about uh, JFK assassination. These are the books that I was talking about. And now there's a new one out about Marilyn Monroe and Bobby Kennedy being involved. And I read a, a press account of it. And it's just garbage. It's just speculation. And now they're doing that to Marilyn again. But these are the books about, um, about um, the JFK assassination. Vincent Bugliosi called... Uh, reclaiming history. It should be called Distortions of History. James Patterson, the damn novelist, wrote a novel about the House of Kennedy. What, what do you think one of his sources in there? It's the only time I've ever written a review about a book on Amazon, but I had to write one about this because you know one of his main sources was a psychic. Now I'm not putting them down, but the way it was there was no corroboration at all. 
Case closed by Gerald Posner, another piece of trash. Case closed, Oswald alone. And this new one, Kennedy's Avenger by Dan Abrams. It talks about the fact that Jack Ruby basically killed Lee Harvey Oswald defending uh, JFK's honor. There's no substance to any of those books, and it drives me crazy uh, when I see them. So, where does that leave us? Dorothy Kilgallen's murder, as I said, being cover up then, cover up now. So the conclusion, well, let, me go, let me go to, uh, to uh, we talked about Marilyn Monroe, let's go to, uh, to JFK, and then I'll come back a minute. Oh, Purdue, I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's, here's John Kennedy. What did we lose? Well, we lost a, a, a president of the United States. Who knows what he would have done? I didn't agree with everything he did. Nobody probably did. But hopefully he could have gotten us out of Vietnam, he, civil rights, uh, you know, all of these different kind of things. And he was just killed at, at, you know, at 46 years old. We lost him. What did he lose? Well, he lost time. He lost time with his kids. He lost time with Jackie. You know, in the, in, there's a book out there that I'd recommend to you by, that's, uh, that's uh, prefaced by Carolyn uh, Kennedy, and it's Jackie Kennedy's memoir that was put out just after JFK died. And it talks about the time he spent with his kids before he went to the office and, and all of those things he did. That's what we lost. Another l human being, not just everything that we've heard about him and his, the things that were, yeah, he had his flaws. They, all of these three people had their flaws, but he was an incredible man. And this is Dorothy Kilgallen. And what did she lose? She lost the time with her precious son, Carrie, and her other two, two uh, uh, children. She could never play with them again. I've tried to say to these people that I want to investigate her death. She was a mother of three children. Forget her celebrity status. Get her the justice she, she deserves. That was Dorothy Kilgallen. What did we lose? One of the greatest, if not the greatest, journalists who ever lived. She was like Walter Cronkite and David Brinkley rolled into one. She didn't give you all the politics and, the, and, the, and everything else going on. She just gave you the, the, the facts. There's Marilyn. Marilyn loved children. All she wanted, by the way, was to have a child. She thought if she could get, get over the thing with, Joe, uh, with uh, Bobby Kennedy, Mary, maybe she would marry Joe DiMaggio again and have a child. And the story I want to leave with you is by Bob Levitt, Robert Levitt, who was... Um, the son of er Ethel Merman, who was the Broadway uh, star. And he met her on the scene of No Business is Like Show Business, and he was about 10 years old, and she befriended him. And they sat on the sidelines at the set. I love this story. And on another set, they were filming what they called the, the Prince Valiant uh, movie. And, and uh, Marilyn got him a sword, a play sword from there. And they played with each other, with the two swords and all of that. That's the Marilyn Monroe that died. That's who she was, just a sin. Let's go back to, I just want to mention this. I've had the honor of my life. All of my, uh, all of my books, my research books, 30 of them, my, my notes uh, through the years, all of my uh, videotapes from my criminal defense uh, days uh, on television, all of this kind of thing. I got the honor of my life because my alma mater, Purdue University, despite it taking me six years to get through, Six, uh, yeah, six years to get through, is going to be the, the archival depository for all of my uh, materials, all of my body of work. And I'm not bringing it up to, to brag. I'm bringing it up because it's going to contain everything in all of my books, including the new one, the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. Everything will be available for researchers through the years. And I'm very proud of that, but I'm very humbled by it. So what's the conclusion that I come up with here? <clears throat> Excuse me. In, uh, in collateral damage. If Robert, Ed Kennedy, if Robert Kennedy had been prosecuted for complicity in Marilyn Monroe's death, a murder in 1962, based on compelling evidence at the time, he would have been rendered powerless and there would have been no JFK assassination in 1963 because Bobby's enemies would not have had to have rendered him powerless because what? He would have been powerless any, anyway by having been uh, prosecuted for Maryland's death. No JFK assassination. And then it goes further. In 1965, Dorothy Kilgallen would not have been killed for what she found out about the JFK assassination because there would have been none. Those two lives would have been saved if Bobby would have been 
prosecuted for Marilyn Monroe's death. Course of history would have been changed. There's no question about it. Course of history would have been changed. Oops. So here's, a, here's what I'll leave you with. By the side of my writing tubble, table, excuse me, by the side of my writing table, I have this saying. The dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living to do so for them. These three individuals were all denied justice when they died. They should have never died, as I say. So it's my, uh, my job to be their voices with my books and to try to influence everyone out there. Uh, I've written a letter to the Los Angeles District Attorney demanding that they reinvestigate Marilyn's death. If you feel strongly about that, contact the LADA. If you feel strongly that Dorothy Kilgallen uh, was uh, uh, murdered and that uh, the New York Police Department should investigate, do that. If you feel strongly that uh, Stephen Fagan, Lindsay Richardson, and Nicola Langford, and a professor named Hollifield, who run the uh, Sixth Floor Museum at Daly Plaza, that they should stop distorting history in terms of the JFK assassination, do something about it. Go ahead and con you know, co contact them and ask them to co please quit distorting history about all this. Because if we don't do it, Marilyn Monroe's reputation will continue to be tarnished, Dorothy Kilgallen's will, and, Dor and, and JFK will never get the proper uh, recognition because basically what's he most remembered for? The JFK assassination instead of, of, of those wonderful accomplishments he had. So again, the dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living to do so for them. And that's something I'm going to continue to do. Thank you so much. Thank you for that outstanding presentation, Mark. A few questions. Um, you're a man who does copious research, takes prodigious notes, no matter uh, where they come from and follow the leads. What kind of criticism have you received uh, about your book that you would like to address here tonight? Well, and I understand this. There are people out there who still love the Kennedys. They want to remember Camelot. They want to remember all the good things that happened. But you know what, and, and I've, I've gotten criticized for that. Uh, I don't know if I'll hear from the Kennedy family or not. I've, I've offered to debate any one of them. Robert Kennedy Jr. basically said that it was Carlos Marcello and the, the mafia who were involved in, in JFK's death. Uh, I've got all kinds of confirmation with that. Uh, I've suggested to my publisher that if they can get Robert Kennedy to sit down and talk with me in, a, in a, any kind of forum, I would do that. Caroline Kennedy, I sent her uh, The Reporter Knew Too Much and Denial of Justice. I'll send her this book and ask her if she wants to speak. But, uh, it, it, you know, when I started into this, I'll tell you, Tom, I, I really was reticent about going after Bobby Kennedy, and uh, yet the evidence was so... Um, evident in terms of the fact that he was involved with Maryland's death because he did some good things in life. The Cuban middle, Missile Crisis, he might have saved us from a nuclear war. Civil rights, all of that. But people need to be held accountable. Ron Pataki needs to be held accountable. Uh, Bobby Kennedy needs to be held accountable for what he did back there even though he's passed away. And so uh, that's how I answer the criticism and I'm, I'm willing to take it. Uh, for the most part though, I've had um, incredible support for for especially uh, a lot of people don't know as much about Dorothy as I wish they did but uh, there's a, there's a lot of sorrow out there now for what happened to Marilyn Monroe that's for sure and that's that's what I'm happy to see but we're not even close now to, uh, yet to get her the justice she deserves can you tell us on the other side of the coin uh, some of the praises that you've received and it's okay this is your 15 minutes of fame to brag about yourself, but can you tell us about some of the uh, praises you've pr received in the press? Well, uh, the, uh, the reviews have been wonderful. Uh, I've done some presentations and there's, <clears throat> you know, 85, 90,000 views already of those. And I, I'm assuming that hopefully we'll have as many here. Uh, newspaper accounts, other things have been uh, positive. You know, it's kind of the same situation that when I got uh, Purdue and, and we started talking, I thought they had the wrong guy <laughs> in terms of them wanting to honor me by having all of my body of work and everything. 
uh, I, I'm being humble, but I'm being truthful. I, I'm, not, I'm not an intellectual at all. Uh, my wife and I spent uh, last evening with two remarkable women here in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Dallas. And one of them, Kathleen, gave me information about the fact that she actually saw, uh, she knew uh, Car Carlos Marcello, called him Uncle Carly. Her name was Kathleen. And she knew him. And uh, you know, she knew uh, about a situation where she was asked to go to the uh, Adolphus Hotel with this, uh, this, this man uh, after he played with her curls and things like that and sat on her lap and went down there. And when she got to the Adolphus Hotel at a cafe, she saw him with Jack Ruby. Uh, these two women are remarkable. One of them is a, is a civic leader who said to me that maybe she'll get involved with uh, trying to get the Sixth Floor Museum uh, to change their attitude in terms of what they do. So, you know, that, that's wonderful praise uh, that I hear uh, from people. And, you know, Facebook is amazing and the, and the world is amazing now because I hear from people all over the world. Uh, who, who read the, what I've written. It, I, I will tell you it's kind of funny, Tom, because people say my books are easily read. But that's because I don't have a great vocabulary. I'm from a small town in, in Indiana. And so I hope I'm an inspiration to people out there, uh, uh, writers especially. I mentor writers who want to become published, that if I can do this, anybody can. As I say, all of this was out there. How, how hard was it to find Dorothy Kilgallen's autopsy? It was at the National Archives. So. I hope, Tom, that the, the praise I take uh, will, will, um, you know, will end up with other researchers taking my research and doing something with it. That would be high praise as well. I find it interesting, <clears throat> even in the 60s, that they had the unmitigating gall to think that if they could buy up every copy. I've been in, associated with books most mm -hmm. of my life. Yeah. There's such things as a second printing. <laughs> Yeah, well, there, there, I, don't, I don't know if there really was back then because obviously uh, there were only so many copies. Uh, Frank Capel was a very controversial character. They badmouthed him and everything. But if you read the FBI uh, documents, they sent the book to, to, to Bobby Kennedy. They had him read it. It had all of these allegations in there. I mean, he, he knew that it, it easily could be to get into the media. It wouldn't have gotten into the media like it is today. But all it took was probably one journalist. But you know, Dorothy Kilgallen really never wrote too much about the, the, the warts and all with the JFK uh, or with the Kennedy family. I think back then they felt like that a lot of that was just personal and everything that way. So that's the only reason I can see. But uh, as, as far as I know, there is no uh, second printing uh, at that time. And so that book basically, talk about censorship, I mean basically that's what happened. But if you can imagine, the Kennedys combined with the FBI go out and buy the copies. That's kind of hard to, to swallow if you think about it. Your wife is a librarian. Uh, how did she help you find some information you didn't have? Well, she's my uh, conscience with regard to what I do in my work. I, I love her very much. I hope she doesn't mind. I'm going to mention her name, Wenning Liu. She's a librarian at Santa Clara, California, Santa Clara University. Uh, she's a catalog librarian there. She keeps me honest. Uh, the only disputes we really have is that she loves footnotes and I don't. Uh, but we, we've, gotten, we've gotten through all that. But, uh, you know, she reads my material. Uh, she's very detailed. She's a, a supreme editor. Um, and so, you know, she's, she's my partner. She's really made a lot of difference. This book is a very thick book. I mean, uh, it was amazing to me. You know, it, a book is amazing for you that uh, don't know, and, and my wife Lou really knows this. It's, I think I, I compare it to an artist, and I don't mean to say I have the creative ability they do, but they, they start with a, with a canvas, there's nothing on there, right? Well, that's what I do. I start with a, a page, and there's no words on there. This new book is 185,000 of them. It has the longest subtitle, I think, in history, okay? Collateral Damage, The Mysterious Deaths of Dorothy Kilgallen, or of Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen, and uh, the ties that bind them to Robert Kennedy and the JFK assassination. Okay, that's a handful. And, and yet, you know, um, it's 15 years worth of research. I'd never written about three people before. But she keeps me honest, and, uh, and she, she's as responsible for my books as I am. What's the biggest challenge you had writing this book? It was putting all the dots together. It was a giant sized puzzle because uh, of how I handled it. But it, it turned out to be a blessing. 
Uh, like I said, you would normally go ahead and investigate Maryland's death first in 62, then JFK, then Dorothy. Well, I didn't do that. I, JFK first because of the Melvin Belli situation and all of that in the 60 election. Then I got into Dorothy and her JFK assassination and all that. I was going to quit. But then I investigated Maryland's death. But by investigating Maryland's death, it opened up a lot of new ideas for the JFK assassination as well as Dorothy Kilgallen. And so it turned out to be a blessing. Uh, but I thought, you know, when I sent in the manuscript to the publisher, to the editor, and I, what I do in the book is I alternate the three stories, okay? I start with Marilyn, then JFK, then Dorothy, and I do all this. And I sent it to the editor. I thought they were going to come back and say, Mark, this is a mess. <laughs> this is a mess. You need to move this here and that and everything. I couldn't believe it when I got the, the, day, the day I got it. And the editor said, this is a great book, Mark. Nice going. <laughs> I thought, I don't know how all this came together. Sometimes you don't. That's the creative process that I love. And any creative person will tell you that's the most fun. The publishing of the book, all the other kind of things, but it's the creative process that I love. This question is from the virtual audience. This is such a fan fascinating presentation. We're experiencing uh, a number of interrupts. One is in Frisco, one's in Dallas. Will you be able to make a recording available to watch in the future? And this is from Richard and Karen. The answer is absolutely categorically yes. And it will be posted on YouTube approximately about two weeks or maybe less. And, uh, and when you do watch it, be sure and subscribe to the Channel 16 uh, City of Allen channel, uh, where we have about 500 outstanding videos for you to watch from past programs. And this will be added to the canon. It's amazing to me, by the way, I told Tom before, you know, in the old days, you know, I'm, I'm 76 years old, so I know what the old days are. I would, I would have talks about my legal work or whatever it was, and you talk to an auditorium full of people, that was it, that was it, all right? And I told, I told my wife today, I said, you know, uh, this, this will be up on YouTube. It's like talking to the world. It's just fascinating that that happens. And this library is amazing, you know, to give me an opportunity, my second time here. I love Tom and, I, and, and these, uh, these uh, gentlemen, Aaron and Kevin, who helped put all, put all this presentation together. This is the first time I've ever done a presentation, and I don't think I did too badly to use a clicker to change the, uh, the, the, uh, the slides, okay? I'm getting, I'm getting to be pretty good because my previous great accomplishment was learning how to use a screenshot on, uh, on the computer. So as you can tell, I'm a complete techno dope, but these have all, people have all helped me look good today. Well, thank you for joining us, Mark.